and stingrays, trapped in one pool for five months of the year. Bull shark and sawfish right in front of the boat. Five giant hunters fighting at the top of the food chain. Don't want to get in front of that thing. It's predator versus predator. Rolling, it's spinning, it's biting. How have these aquatic monsters adapted to survive? And which one is king of the pool? This is Australia's Northern Territory, over a million square kilometers of remote deserts, swamps, and forests. Every year, a natural phenomenon leaves five top predators fighting for survival. Only the toughest can survive this environment. I've come to Northern Australia to witness an amazing event. Every year during the dry season, the river drops, forming isolated pools that trap several species of mega predators. I want to find out how all of these animals can coexist. I'm Dr. Zeb Hogan. I travel the world to study and protect giant freshwater fish. From the Northern Territory's capital city of Darwin, I'm traveling about 250 kilometers into the bush to find three monster fish species. Giant stingray, freshwater sawfish, and bull sharks, along with two mega reptiles, salt and freshwater crocodiles. I've assembled a team of local experts to help me catch each of these predators and uncover the secrets of their survival. We will be working with some of the world's most dangerous fish and reptiles. Any mistakes handling them could prove fatal. We've driven about five hours from Darwin. We're gonna be on our own. We've brought everything we need. So now, before it gets dark, we have to get all this stuff unloaded. This is a river that has a lot of saltwater crocodiles and we don't want to camp right next to it or saltwater crocodile might come into camp. Coincidentally, the crocodiles might have chosen this pool for the same reasons as us. There's uh, a crossing right below camp and the fish, it's difficult for fish to move past the crossing. And so what Dion has said is that that's just a, a fish collector's dream. It's a natural place where fish collect. We're going after the freshwater sawfish and giant stingray first. But this is dangerous territory. Although these pools are shallow and clear, we need to work at night when our first two species are most active. There's eye shine, eye shine from crocodiles. One, two, three, four, There's another one five, there too. six, seven, seven, eight, eight or nine crocs right out in front of us. I'll only go in if I can see the water um, is clear and shallow in front of me. Let's go have a look. Right. What we're doing tonight, we're just walking along the shallow areas of the pool and looking for uh, whip rays and, and maybe sawfish. They're easier to spot at night with our lights. It's absolutely incredible that you'll have a pool, an isolated pool, uh, you know, tens or sometimes even hundreds of miles from the ocean that'll have several species of large predators. It's a little bit spooky. It, I wouldn't want to be out here without lights. Whoa! Croc, right in front of Dion. They're all in these shallows here. We're in very shallow, clear water, so as long as we keep looking around, the croc won't be able to sneak up on us. Grant wants to tag any stingray to find out if they move between river systems, or if each population is isolated. The more diverse the population, the better the chances of survival. No 
no sawfish so far. What is it? Bull shark or a sawfish? A bull shark. Kate just saw a bull shark. She thought it was a sawfish. It was a bull shark. Bull sharks spend their lives in both salt and fresh water. They have been responsible for attacks on humans. While we're out here, this is one fish we really need to keep an eye on. What do you see? Whip fry. A small ray. Oh, neat. Cute little fella. Oh, awesome. Up until a few years ago, this was thought to be the same species as the giant freshwater stingray that's found in Southeast Asia. But recently, this was just described as its own species. You guys have seen some, some big ones, right? Yeah, up, up to about two and a half, three meters across the disc, so. Two and a half, three meters. That's nearly 10 feet. So we're just taking this baby stingray to a pool upstream. We're gonna keep it in a separate pool until morning when I can get a good look. It's okay. It's just uh, caught on the barb there. Just have to be careful. It's actually coated with a toxin as well. So. Yeah, I've gotten a little nick before and it doesn't feel good. Nice work. The stingray has adapted to survive here. And you can just see, look, it immediately went down to the bottom of the riverbed, buried itself, and it's almost impossible to see now. It's completely disappeared. And that camouflage, that's a defense against predators when the stingray feels threatened. We want to make sure that the stingray is safe overnight. Well, we're just building a little area uh, for the stingray to hide, especially when it gets light tomorrow morning. That'll protect it from any predators that might be lurking. It's time to check on that little stingray we caught last night. If it's still there and it's doing okay, we'll tag it and get it back in the river. So well, here he is. Now that it's daytime, you can get a better look at him. Stingrays are often portrayed as aggressive killers. Their deadly poison could give them the tools they need to fend off other big predators and be king of these pools. So I'm about to get in the pool with the stingray and I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna to react to me being close to it. I'm putting on these boots as a little bit of extra protection in case it gets freaked out and strikes out with its barb. The stingray it wasn't aggressive at all. It almost was behaving like it was curious, but I was able to get quite close to it. It's almost like it didn't even know its barb was there. It seems to me that the only way, the only time a stingray is gonna strike out with its barb is if it feels threatened or provoked. The two great defensive tools, the barb and camouflage, work well to protect the stingray from predators. Onto this net. We're going to move the fish to the main river so Grant can tag it. We don't want to grab hold on it. We don't want to step on it. So we're just very gently trying to steer it over towards the net. There we go. There on the go, net. Let's start. So now we're just going to quickly take it over to the river. If this ray survives to maturity, it could reach over five meters in length. The stingray's mouth tells us there's no way it could rule the pool. Their mouth is located on the underside of their body and it's, they don't have particularly large mouths and they don't have sharp teeth, they have crushing pads. So right now Grant's putting a, an external tag in the fish. I'm just gonna gently put the net down and we're just gonna coax it out of the net. Come on, little buddy. So 
So once it realizes that it's free, there it goes. The Stingray's tough skin, its unique ability to camouflage itself, and a barb that can strike out at potential predators means it's built to defend, not attack. The ray may not sit on top of the food chain, but my next fish could. A relative of the Stingray, the sawfish. These toothy predators live in both fresh and salt water, where they can grow to an amazing seven meters long. Using their saw-like snout, they are expert hunters. Could this lethal weapon make them king of the pool? Before we continue fishing, Dion needs all the manpower available to help him relocate and release a giant sawfish. This 1.8 meter predator has outgrown its aquarium and needs to be released. This is an opportunity for me to study a sawfish up close to determine whether this giant fish could be king of the pool. So the sawfish has arrived from the aquarium. We have our barricade built. It's time to get the sawfish out of the tank and into the river. You all set? Yep, we're bringing okay. the water out. We get about that much water down. Okay, and how's she look? Does she, she look okay? Oh, nice. Yeah, she looks good. She's upright, no scrapes or scratches that I can see. She looks really good. Because they are a protected species, Grant will tag the fish so we can track it and make sure it safely integrates back into the wild. Pretty good size sawfish. Yeah. How long is she? Yeah. Pretty nice. That's around six and a half feet. And she just got too big for, for the aquarium? Well, she's really powerful anyway. Uh-huh. Yeah, you like to see. The sawfish's skin is, is very rough, and if she starts to struggle, this is just to protect my hand. The rough skin is a biological adaptation, armor against predator attacks. But it's not just the rough skin I have to worry about. Also, it's giant snout, full of teeth. Right. Wanna grab that bottom half? Okay, I got her. Really powerful. Oh, it's we just need to get it back into the river as soon as we can. Watch out for the song. We don't want the fish out of water for too long. It's already been through a stressful journey. We're getting close. Man, that was an operation. So. Now we just let her sit here. It's a little bit stressful for her. The sawfish, they will use their saw to defend themselves. And so she whipped around there. She can see us. She's just kind of staking her claim to this, this little spot. There's some deeper water down below, some cooler water. And because she's stressed out, it's probably better if we get her down in the deeper, cooler water. Sawfish have a flattened body that enables them to blend in and to forage on the river bottom. They can sense movement and even heartbeats of berry prey with their snouts. This amazing sensory adaptation could make it ruler of this pool. Dion's just using a stick to guide her saw. That's the only part of the fish that we really need to watch out for. So she's in the deeper water now. Once she's back up to full strength, she, she'll be able to avoid the bull sharks and the saltwater crocodiles that might be waiting downstream. The sawfish seems calmer. We will get basic measurements of this fish before we tag it. 
This will help us determine how much it's grown if it's caught again. Six foot long sawfish. Grant's also put an acoustic tag on this fish. The acoustic tag, it emits a signal, a coded signal, so that Grant will be able to follow this fish. And if she eats, we know she's strong enough to fend for herself in the wild. So we have a, a dead fish on a string here, on a fishing line, which I'd like to see exactly how the sawfish uses its snout when it's feeding. After a few casts, the sawfish starts to come near the bait. Here she comes. She was approaching the fish, getting close. It seemed like she could sense it and, and taking a few swipes with her snout. Not that time. But this is both a defensive and attacking weapon. So far, the sawfish has shied away from taking the bait. But when we least expect it, She was pretty gentle. Ah. She was pretty gentle when she actually took the fish. But then as soon as she got the fish in her mouth, she started swinging her head. And you can really see how much power she has. Don't want to get in front of that thing. They're using that tooth snout, not only when they feel threatened, but also to hunt, to stun and kill prey. She's actually holding the fish in her mouth. We're gonna take this opportunity to release it back in the river. Dion's trying to just get the net over the saw so that we're not injured. We're gonna flip the sawfish over. Hopefully that'll calm her down. While the sawfish has a strong claim as king of the pool, this powerful predator has some evolutionary downsides their mouth is not constructed to bite chunks off of prey. So this sawfish can only take prey that will fit inside its mouth. That means they can't take big stingrays, bull sharks, or crocodiles. You can see the, her flattened body. They're used to cruising along the bottom of the river, sensing fish and, and crustaceans with its snout, striking the prey with its saw. The sawfish may be one of the world's largest freshwater fish, but its sheer size does not automatically make it king. It's probably not right at the top of the food chain because of its small mouth and the fact that it doesn't uh, feed and hunt as aggressively as some of the other predators in this system. Now that I've eliminated both the sawfish and the stingray as rulers of this pool, I want to study a prehistoric predator that's related to both species. The bull shark. Bull sharks are one of the five mega predators in these pools, and they're renowned for their strength and aggression. They begin their lives in freshwater, then move to the ocean. I'm going to help scientist Grant Johnson catch and tag bull sharks for his research. And I can learn where these predators fit in the food chain. Okay, let's Ready go. To go. 
I spot a familiar predator, but she's not alone. So incredibly, this is the, the sawfish that we tagged and released. It's sitting stationary in shallow water. And a bull shark, a bull shark coming straight towards us. Bull shark and sawfish right in front of the boat. Here. This is a perfect opportunity to learn about the hierarchy of this pool. How will these two voracious hunters react to each other? In spite of being in close proximity, the bull shark and the sawfish are barely reacting to each other. The juvenile shark is too small to pose a threat to the large sawfish. But there is another danger lurking in this pool. About 20 feet off the front of the boat, there's a six foot freshwater crocodile sitting underneath the water. There's another one, even larger, about 20 feet off the back of the boat moving straight towards us. As we get into the main section of the pool now, we need to be very careful. Anywhere where we cannot see the bottom of the river, we have to avoid those areas. There could be something down there, a big bull shark, a big saltwater crocodile that could really be dangerous. None of the animals are acting aggressively toward each other. This is an amazing real-time example of how so many top predators coexist in the same pool. I throw some food in the water to see if the sawfish has recovered enough from her capture to feed. She sees it falling, she's circling on the prey, and she'll come back on it. She's still looking. Look at her. Oh, she smells the fish. Get it. Nice! She's feeding. Typically only a healthy fish, a fish that's not stressed out, will feed. As she gets used to having predators again, gets used back to hunting again, I think this is a great sign. Grant and I motored to the spot where we saw the bull sharks. Is this a good time of day? This is a perfect time of day, Zeb. Just on the evening, everything's cooling down. All the bait fish are starting to move and feed. The bull shark is one of the most dangerous sharks in the world. But like other shark attacks, these incidents are rare and occur because humans enter the shark's natural habitat. And with bull sharks, that gets complicated. They live in areas, freshwater areas and canals where um, they're close, close proximity to people. So you've got this interaction between people and bull sharks and they're just a very aggressive shark. Often called the garbage cans of the sea, bull sharks are known to eat just about anything. This ability could push the bull shark to the top of the food chain. Let's see if the sharks feed. How opportunistically it feeds could indicate its place in this ecosystem. So as soon as the bait hit the water, the bull shark started to behave differently. They swam around more quickly, they became more agitated, and they formed into a pack. Started circling the prey until one had enough courage, came in and started taking bites. These fish hunt in packs, giving them strength in numbers, an advantage over other lone predators and prey in these pools. Now Grant wants to tag some of the small sharks we have baited into the shallows. He hopes to learn the mortality rate of bull sharks in this river system. If the numbers are high, authorities could introduce regulations to protect them. I'm gonna to try to capture them with the cast net. We have all of our tagging gear. We're gonna tag the fish, get a genetic sample, and release them back to the river. Here we go. Okay, let's go and do it. One in front of me here. I'm gonna see if uh, I can't get him in the shallow rapid here. <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like they're able to swim very quickly. Uh, it's, not, it's a good way for them to get away from me or get away from a potential predator, but it also helps them when they're hunting, move very fast, attack very quickly. 
they are capable of speed bursts of over 17 kilometers an hour. If I get one in the shallows, he's all mine. <laughs> Got one. All right, so we're going to tag the shark. Okay. Um, 64 centimeters long. Yep. Um, which makes this probably um, sort of young at a year. Mm -hmm. It's under a year old, and yet it's already two feet long. This fast growth rate could help it top the food chain. There you go. And so our bull sharks, are they, he didn't seem to react much to that tag. Are they pretty hardy fish? Oh, very hardy, very tough fish. We've tagged this shark, got a DNA sample, length, and now it's ready to go back in the river. The measurements of each fish are recorded next to the individual tag number. The more sharks we can collect this information from, the better the data. Grant's going to try to throw a cast net over the bull shark. I'll remove it from the cast net and run to the main pool for relief. Nice throw. Yeah, very thick for the teeth. Yeah, so this shark is large enough where we don't want to get our fingers near its mouth. Sometimes they also will twist. Okay, so we're ready to go? Okay. Total length is 99. This shark should live in the river system for several years before migrating back to the ocean where it could grow to almost four meters long. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay, well, is this shark ready to go? Shark ready to go. Even though most of the bull sharks living in the river are small, they're born fully formed, fully able to hunt and defend themselves. Bull sharks, they also have very tough skin and they're able to move very quickly. So those three traits mean that they can probably escape most predators that they'll encounter. In terms of being a predator themselves, they have extremely sharp, shearing teeth. They're able to take chunks out of prey. They hunt in packs and they have a very keen sense of smell and they can sense uh, vibrations in the water. Taken together, they're extremely formidable predator and probably near the top of the food chain. But there's a far bigger predator out here and one that I think could easily challenge the bull shark and pose a threat to everything in this pool. Salt and freshwater crocodiles are the largest reptiles in Australia, and they could be the top predators in this ecosystem. I'm heading to Crocosaurus Cove in the middle of Darwin City. It boasts some of the largest saltwater crocodiles in captivity. Nigel Palmer, a crocodile manager, invites me to join the feeding show so I can learn how saltwater crocodiles predate. This information could help keep me safe when I catch one in the wild. So the croc's just very slowly inching up. It's totally underwater, so if that water wasn't clear, you wouldn't be able to see it at all. Now it's my chance to feed the beast. I'm gonna put a bit of a vibration over this side of him and I'm going to try and turn him back this way and then um, get him in a position where it's going to be great for you. Okay. okay. We'll see what happens. Work on his right hand side. Just pull it out when you get a chance. Yeah? Just top completely pulled out? Yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, he's off. That's all good. Look at that thing. It's a huge animal, huh? He's a, he's a big boy. Even though this croc is in captivity, are we seeing some of the natural behaviors that you'd see in the wild? The shallow water is their, is their space. They, they don't tend to eat or even cap capture prey in deeper water. 
Um, they can't swallow underwater for obvious reasons. Uh, the gullet will open and they'll take in too much water. Hunting in the shallows keeps these giants away from the stingray and sawfish, who prefer the deeper sections of the pool. An adaptation that might be key to their survival and could explain how three big predators cohabit the same pool. I've seen just how fearless an adult salty is. Now I'm heading to Kakadu National Park to meet up with a team of croc experts and park rangers. With their help, I hope I'll find my last two predators, salt and freshwater crocs in the wild. Over 10,000 crocodiles live here, so I have to be more careful than ever. I'm joining Adam Britton along with Chief Ranger Gary Linder to find and capture freshwater and saltwater crocodiles. I'm hoping to learn how both monsters thrive here and which one is king of the pool. Just making last minute preparations, uh, getting the harpoon ready, getting the deck cleared up because we're going to want to bring the croc on board. We'll be um, using this harpoon pole. And you can just see a hole there. Yep. We just fit that in there. And basically, we just uh, harpoon the crop. That goes under the skin. And then it's just like a fish. But we're playing him from the, ideally, from the back of the neck. Right. Got control over the animal and its head. Does it hurt the croc? A little bit of pain. But what's only a small pain to the crocodile could be saving its life. If a crocodile does attack or target humans here, the rangers will have to kill the animal. Gary is involved in a program that prevents attacks on people. By catching crocs, he makes them wary of humans and conditions them to steer clear of populated areas. Sometimes you might have to harpoon a few crocs to uh, increase your chances of getting a target animal. What's a target animal? An animal that's being uh, inquisitive or going up to a boat ramp, really interested in people launching and removing boats from the water. You want to try and discourage that behaviour because it can lead to potentially uh, more dangerous behaviour. In the 1970s, after decades of hunting, saltwater crocodiles were nearly extinct in this region. Today, their population has bounced back to over 100,000 in the Northern Territory alone. That's nearly one croc for every two people. And that means more and more humans are coming into contact with them. Can we kill that light, please? When we get close to a croc, the only light we want on the boat is the spotlight, and we need to be very quiet. If they hear anything or see any other light, they'll go underwater. We'll have a look at that one over there, eh? Just spotlight him for buck. See if that's a freshie. You think this is a freshie? Yeah, yeah. We'll just stop the talking now. Just drop it down a bit, drop it down. Okay, up a bit. Now just direct buck. We'll just have a look, see what he is. Might be a small salty. Yeah, right on him. Yep, salty. Okay, buck, small salty. The two crocodile species can be identified by the shape of their heads. Saltwater crocodiles have a broad snout, while their freshwater cousins is long and narrow. This gives the freshie a useful adaptation for hunting in smaller rivers. But it also means it can only take on small prey. Once the crocs go underneath the water, we, we don't really have any, any way to figure out where they are. So it's so shape in the water, but it might just have been. So there are one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a group of nine crocs, nine eye shines that I see. I think that's the area we'll probably go down and try to target one of those crocs down there. I have an important job in this operation, to blind the croc and steer it with my spotlight so we can get close. When we're going up to him, have your arm right out here so you can get the glare as much as possible off the boat. Okay. Okay, left. Got him? Yep. Got one. Okay, neutral. Adam did we that. have the croc. 
It's harpoon. It's below the boat. See him yet? No. Oh, he's right underneath us now. So if you just put it out there, he's really got a bit of uh, zip in him. This one. How can you tell? It's a lot of power there. Yeah. Extremely powerful animal. So he's under the boat, rolling, twisting, biting. Ah! Okay, just got him. Just hold that one. He's rolling again. A lot of power. You can see that rolling. Incredible power. Yeah. Get back under the boat. Is it on? The rope on? The croc's just below the boat. It's rolling, it's spinning, it's biting. It's not tired out yet. Once it's finally calmed down, Adam's just going to try to tap it on the head, get it to open its mouth, and then put that noose around its upper jaw. Here we go. Yeah, it's mouth open. Wow. See how quick that was? That uh, is incredible. Now, that's it. You got it. That's what the cycle. Okay, Adam, a bit of pressure there. Ah, oh, that knot come off. Uh, yep. It's all right. We'll get another one. The croc got away. The noose came off, came untied off the jaw, and that croc, he had a lot of energy, just rolling, biting, and he just got off the line. This predator is a fighter, unlike any fish I've dealt with. Saltwater crocs can hunt on land, as well as in the water, using a lethal death roll technique to snatch and kill their prey. They are capable of taking an animal as big as an adult buffalo, but they can also survive six months without food. It's gone underwater. We need to get a croc as soon as possible. Once the sun comes up, our trick of using the spotlight to temporarily stun them won't work. We have one just in front of us here. Got it? Got it. Mark, this one's going to be a bit tricky, so if you back out and go that way. We have the croc on. The harpoon is under the skin, but there are some logs here. We want to try to get the croc away from this wood. We don't want to get tangled up in here. Clean one. It's right below us. He's just slapping the boat and doing another roll. So they'll use every part of their body, their head, their tail. So right now it's it's trying to get that harpoon out, but yeah. if it was if it had a hold of some prey. Just trying to get him up. He's he's rolling now. You just really need to get his mouth open. I'm trying to lighten his eyes, make it hard for him to see. Adam is trying to get a noose around his upper jaw when he opens his mouth. And Gary is holding on to the rope with the harpoon and just playing the croc and giving him line when here we go. The noose is on. So cutting the harpoon line so that we don't have two lines. So now that we have the rope around the croc's upper jaw, the next part of this process. Jaws are closed. duct tape around the mouth and around the eyes. We cover its eyes to calm it down. We want to avoid causing it too much stress. Okay, pull him up, someone around the head, Zeb, around the body. Okay, pull him in. Now, on the hip, straight on the hip, that's it. A croc's bite force is more than 2,000 kilograms of pressure. We need to be so careful. This croc is still fighting. It has much more power than I thought. Still struggling. Okay, we're just keeping pressure on him all the time. Keep him from whipping around, injuring himself, injuring us. Okay, well done, that was good. It's just getting light, huh? Perfect timing. Yeah. A lot of mullet out here. Seen a lot of saltwater crocs out here tonight, but no freshwater crocs. <laughs> this may be not surprising with the number of salties that we saw down there. We know that freshies don't like salties and vice versa. Salties kill freshies just to get them out of an area. In general, the further upriver, the more likely you're 
going to find freshwater crocodiles and the less likely you'll find saltwater yes. crocodiles. Yeah. The freshwater crocodile has adapted to move faster and travel farther on land to get away from their intrusive cousins. This enables them to move upstream to find pools where food is still available. This evolutionary adaptation has allowed the two croc species to coexist without competing directly for prey or habitat. We're trying to get this croc uh, out of the boat onto dry land. But uh, once we get the ropes off, it's going to be able to move freely. So I'm, I need to hold very tightly onto the head so it doesn't swing its head around. They're holding. Keep it yours. You got it? You got it? Got it. Now, someone jump in quick. OK, when he hits the ground, yeah. straight on the head. Straight on the head. Straight down. Straight down. Catching this croc has shown me just how strong they are. And it could prevent this powerful predator from hurting humans or vice versa. I'm not used to, to handling crocs, but apparently we just don't want to give the croc any room to, to maneuver. He's not tied up right now. The only way that he's secured is by this rope in his mouth. Go the head to head measurements. Round width, 102. Okay, total length, 2.66. About a nine foot croc. So you get twice as long as this. The saltwater crocodile is the largest reptile on Earth. It can grow to six meters long. That's three times longer than me and bigger than other predators in the pool. Probably the, the big dominant croc in this system here is around five meters or 16 feet and probably getting up to around 700 kilo or more. So you might have a salty, an eight foot salty sitting next to a eight foot freshie and the salty's thinking, hey, this guy next to me is going to make nice lunch. Yeah, I, you know, the eight foot salty's a lot more powerful animal than an eight foot freshie. With its smaller size and narrower snout, the freshwater crocodile just can't compete with these giants. This guy has been in the sun for quite a while. It's time to get him back in the river. Time to release the croc. We got the information that we need. We're removing the, the tape around the croc's mouth and also the cable tie that's on the croc's mouth. Okay, cable tie's gone. Okay, you push down now. Now hand over the eyes straight away. Yep, over the eyes, close it. So we have just a thin piece of duct tape over the croc's eyes, ropes coming out of either side of its mouth to restrain it until we're able to just walk back away from the croc. Okay, go Zip. Richard, Adam, go. Beautiful. Uh, that croc will now remember that capture and he'll be leery next time he sees people. It's obvious to me now that the saltwater crocodile dominates this dry season pool. All of its attributes add up to make a super predator, unmatched in its sheer size and power. If it survives to adulthood, the only real threat, apart from man, is another large saltwater crocodile. As the dry season comes to an end, so is my trip to the Australian outback. But I've learned these pools are abundant with life. The most amazing thing about the predators that live in these pools is their size. Every single one of them has the ability to grow nearly three meters or 10 feet long. They also each have their own unique adaptations that allow them to survive in dry season pools. But only one is the ultimate predator. Because of its extremely large size, ability to dominate all other animals, keen senses, and lightning fast attack, it's clear that the saltwater crocodile is the king of predator pool. The saltwater croc might be king, but evolution has ensured that when conditions get tough, each predator has the tools to stay alive.